Hi there, my front end friends. Nesting has come to native CSS and it's pretty awesome. And a really quick example of what it is, uh, where you might have your navigation styles for something where you have your navigation, but then you're using these descendant selectors. So you're having to repeat yourself with primary navigation. Well, with nesting, we can get rid of that and do something like this instead, where the UL and the A selectors are nested inside of the primary navigation and it works perfectly fine. So if I came here and let's just change this gap to a five rem and you can see that it has updated up above. Now, for those of you who are used to nesting because you've been using it with a preprocessor like SAS or less, this might seem really familiar to you, but there's actually some pretty big differences and gotchas in how nesting works with native CSS. First though, we're gonna talk about the very basics of how it works, why we need this ampersand here, when we don't need an ampersand because you only need to have them sometimes, but it's different from the preprocessors and how that works. So we'll talk about some of the gotchas with it that you might not expect. We'll talk about my single favorite feature of nesting. And of course, we're gonna address browser support as well. And just before we dive into this, just in case you're new here, my name is Kevin and here at my channel, I help you fall madly, deeply in love with CSS. And if I can't get you to fall in love with it, I'm hoping to at least help you be a little bit less frustrated by it. So if you do plan to use nesting in the near future, understanding the ins and outs of how it works and the little gotchas, that will definitely help you not be as frustrated with it. So let's dive in and see what what we can do with this. So what is nesting? Well, we already sort of saw that when I threw that together where we can have uh, this ampersand here that is replacing the idea of the primary navigation. So if we want descendant selectors, we don't have to repeat ourselves. We can nest those descendant selectors inside of the parent selector. Now this leads to this first thing of like, why do I have this ampersand here? And it's very important that this is here. Uh, just to show you, if I remove these from here and hit save, my navigation is breaking. And if you're used to a preprocessor, that wouldn't be the case. So we'll talk about that in a second. But I do want to talk about what might be a little bit of an elephant in the room for some people of you shouldn't use descendant selectors at all. And 100%, we want to be careful with specificity. And we hear this a lot where they're saying, like, you know, don't you just make everything a class selector. That way you just have the same specificity for everything. You don't run into any issues and all of that. And I definitely think it's good advice early on when you're getting into CSS, because you're not worrying about these other things. But once you sort of get past those early stages and you can understand the implications of the code that you're writing, not taking advantage of descendant selectors, as far as I'm concerned, is like riding a bike for the rest of your life with the training wheels on. At one point, you probably want to take those training wheels off and take advantage of what a bike can actually do, because that bike, you know, it, it, you're, you're wasting your time if you're just with the training wheels on all the time. But of course, you're not going to go all crazy. Most people aren't going to ride a unicycle and take another wheel off and all of that, right? So we do want to be a little bit careful because uh, we could do something similar. I broke something along the way here, but you can see that things are working uh, if I did this. And this is where nesting definitely becomes an issue where we have like my UL and then I'm nesting another level deep to get the LI. Then I'm nesting another level deep to get to my links here. That is, in my opinion, where the wheels fall off of your bicycle completely. Uh, we're raising specificity for no good reason. We're making things a lot less readable uh, and selectors like this are just kind of pointless. So one level deep nesting, in my opinion, is fine. Sometimes you might even go two levels deep for an extra hover or something like that. Uh, if we go back to the original example I had, you know, you need a hover on there. We can do an and hover and I can add a color of red, hit save on that. Uh, and now my links get that. So like this extra level of nesting sometimes can be a little bit handy as well. In my opinion, and it's definitely an opinion, you can disagree with me if you don't like the idea of descendant selectors, but I think nesting and using, even if you're not nesting and you're just using descendant selectors, if you're using them one deep, it's fine. Uh, it's when you start going deeper and deeper, that's where the problems can start popping up. And that brings us to this ampersand. I'm actually using the ampersand in two different ways here, uh, but I want to address what this actually is. And it's a new selector that they've added to CSS and it's called the nesting selector. And we've seen other, we have other symbols that act as selectors as well. So just as an example, you, you've probably even seen use cases where you might have like a nav uh, UL or something like that. So we're, this is the direct descendant. It's a combinator, but we can, you can start things off just with that. So now we have the ampersand as well, which can act as the nesting selector. So it's sort of like taking this primary navigation, it's acting as a placeholder here for it. So we end up with the primary navigation UL. Or the other symbol that is a selector, unlike the direct, you know, the combinator I just mentioned is the star, which is our universal selector, which just selects everything. Um, so we've had symbols before, they've added a new one. But it is different, just very quickly, if you're used to preprocessors, um, it is different because if we come and take a look in our dev tools here, we'll notice that it's actually kind of interesting. Because in SAS DevTools, when we used, if you do it, it actually gets that like our 
ampersand here would actually get compiled into being primary navigation. It's a string, it gets turned into that. If I open my DevTools here in Chrome and I come take a look here, I actually see the ampersand in here. Look at that. And it's telling me that it's a placeholder for primary navigation. And I can see that in my DevTools, which is really, really cool and handy. Uh, but so it's acting as primary navigation UL right there. So the nice thing with this is on like preprocessors is we can actually like, you know, I can look for that exact selector in my code and I can find it because that's exactly what's here. Now, one thing I have noticed is sometimes, and I don't see it on this one, sometimes you find like a little broken uh, property down below uh, that has the ampersand in it, but everything works fine. I think it's just the dev tools sort of trying to figure things out a little bit. And so this is a little bit like preprocessors with custom properties versus variables, like a custom property in CSS is a live value that you can edit and it will change things on your site that are all using that variable. And this is a live object that's referencing this primary navigation. Um, so it's, it's going to act a little bit, there's a few gotchas with it, which we're going to get to. And that actually raises the point of like, why did I even need this in the first place if I nested like this and it's not working? And that comes to one of the rules of how nesting is going to be working with, uh, within native CSS, which is the nested rules have to start with a symbol. And you might be wondering what symbols we need. So I'm just going to show them right here to you. So uh, it's these symbols right here, and we can zoom in a little bit on those. These are the symbols that we have to use, and you'll notice that it might look like this arbitrary list, but here's like, an, you know, we have our app media, we have hover states, we have the class selector, we have these combinators right here, we have an ID selector, the beginning of an attribute selector, and our universal selector. So these are all existing CSS symbols that we had before uh, and now we have the new ampersand which has also been added and to take a look at how this works with symbols what we're actually going to do is if we look in my navigation here i have this last li which is my login one at the top has the class of login on there so what i could do is this is all inside of my primary navigation class so let's find that again we'll move back up here and so we have my primary navigation and as long as we're nested in there, and this is where the colorization of brackets also really helps. Uh, there's, um, I think it's native to VS code now, actually, there used to be an extension for that. Um, but so what I could do is I could say, and just like I did here, the ampersand, and then I could do my login and I could say that the background on this one is going to be white. We add a little bit of padding on there. It's not going to look nice right now. And then we'll just give it a color of black just so just so we have something that's there that looks different. Um, but what I could actually do in this case is I can take that ampersand off and it's still going to work. And just to show you, if I change this, it, it is working up there. And the reason this is working is it's starting with a symbol. And this is kind of weird because it feels like this rule of nesting where if it's an element selector, you need to have an ampersand. If it's not an element selector, then I don't need an ampersand. And if you think of it that way, it is it, it does feel a little awkward. And I don't think it's the right way to think about it. Uh, I think the right way to think about it is just you always need to have a symbol. So if it's just an A like this, it's not going to work because there's no symbol at the beginning. So the whole purpose of this guy is to add that symbol to make the nesting work. And that's not the whole purpose. We can actually do some interesting things with this. Um, but we can see there is my login and it's working. And the other thing is if you don't want to think about that and you just want to say, I always need the ampersand, you can always put one. From what I understand in the spec, the browser behind the scenes is sort of placing these in there anyway. And so if you're going to include it just because you just want to be consistent and you never want to forget, that's completely fine. Um, but I'm probably, you see me using nesting in future videos, I probably won't be bothering with it. Uh, just remember, if it's an element selector, you need it, hammer that home, because I could. We, we use classes for so much stuff, I could see it being one of those things that you forget every now and then. Uh, and especially if you're coming from SAS or something like that, where you weren't needing it, then obviously it's a little bit different as well. And speaking of SAS, one thing that was really popular to do in SAS is to use it for like a BEM naming convention, where uh, we might have something, let's just do it, here we have my primary navigation, and let's do primary navigation and I'm gonna double underscore this with a primary uh, navigation list like that. And this is like a common one, then here would be like a primary navigation list item, a primary na navigation link. And what you would do, and this is really common, if you look up nesting tutorials, you'll probably find stuff on this because they're using preprocessors, where you'd have your primary navigation, and then here, instead of having the UL, because you want to do with that single class selector, you don't want to use a descendant selector, you want your you want your primary navigation double underscore list, and it's not going to work. <laughs> uh, so here we could try it, where I do that, and I make this list, and it breaks everything. <laughs> and 
in CSS nesting, this type of uh, we can't concatenate strings together because it's not a string. This is a live object, like I said. So if we go and take a look in my dev tools here, we're going to see that this primary navigation, that, that rule is not even showing up for it because it's not even targeting this, uh, which is a bit of a shame, but it's just because what it's doing is it's treating this as one selector and it's treating this part here as a second selector. And so it would be sort of the same thing, just because like, let's just say we had, if you have a button accent, you could write it like that and write your rule. And if you wrote accent dot button, like these are the equivalent, they're exactly the same thing. So writing this here would be the equivalent of writing list uh, dot primary navigation in CSS world. And sorry for all the squiggle marks, <laughs> um, <laughs> right? Let's just do that and uh, maybe put something here just there we go um so yeah doing this would be the equivalent of writing something like this and obviously this doesn't work because double underscore list isn't an actual thing um and it's the same thing if you wanted just to do this that would be the equivalent of doing this and this could technically be a valid selector so you know css doesn't know that you don't have a custom element called list <laughs> that you might have a class of primary navigation on it so this idea of concatenating strings that you might see from preprocessors, we can't do it. It's not something that's possible, but that doesn't mean that the ampersand is useless. First of all, we can use it for the UL list like this, like we were doing before, but you can actually use it in combination with other stuff, just not how you might have been using it before. And the way we would do that is to create compound selectors. So if we come down here to where I had my buttons, uh, here I have my button, then I have a primary and, and a button accent here. And so if we come and take a look, I get that not everybody likes this style of naming things. Uh, but if I did it like this with a button primary and a button accent, then what I could do is I could take away all of this. We still want the dot. Uh, and then I could take away this and have an extra close there. Let me just format this to make it a little bit more readable. Uh, tab that over, move that down. There we go. So uh, one thing you'll also notice is the syntax highlighting from VS Code is hit and miss here. Uh, there is a bug report for it in. People are pushing. Now the browser support's getting better. There, people are asking um, for it to be improved upon. So we'll see what happens there. And right now this is broken, even though these are starting with class uh, symbols. So these class selectors should be valid. This is looking for a primary that is nested inside of my button. So that would be almost like if I had a, you know, if I had a span here, span of primary, um, and the more was in there and I hit save, that more is getting those colors because this primary is nested inside of that button. So in this case, that's going to work. Now we don't want that. We want to get something that is my button primary right here. And to be able to get the button primary, that's where the ampersand comes in because it's the placeholder for them. So I can put that there. And now it's not concatenating these, it's making a compound selector. It's sort of one selector all together. So let's go look in our dev tools so we can see this a little bit more uh, what's actually happening here. And so if I take a look here, we have my dot button dot primary. And so it's the double sort of selector that's on there. So this again could be dangerous for specificity reasons. You want to make sure you're doing it on purpose. Maybe you don't like this idea, but this is how the ampersand is going to work with native CSS nesting. So I did want to explain that. Uh, and the same thing, we can go look at this one. And then here I have my button accent right there that's getting these colors on it. The other thing that this is very useful for, even if you don't like this approach um, here where we're doing that, uh, is when you wanna make your hover classes like we saw before, because it is super nice just coming in and doing a hover and focus and not having to repeat the, um, the class name again. I absolutely love that <laughs> so much. So here the background could become uh, dark blue and uh, this VS Code does that to me sometimes. It likes background color. So then we get the hover color and focus color uh, coming like that. This is one of my favorite features of just like quick hover focus states like that using the ampersand. It can be super useful. Um, so yeah, that's one of the nice ones. Not my favorite, but it is a good one. And you might just be wondering because we are nested like an extra level deep, you know, how is this actually going? So once again, dev tools are always our friend where if I come on that, we'll turn on the hover state right here hide that back away and we can see the and and when I hover on top of the and we see the button and primary you can see it's a little funky because we have we have the double and coming there and here it's a little bit weird too um, but it gives us the idea of it's an and focus and it, so it's our primary button basically um, so maybe a little dev tool work could be done on that just to make it a little bit more clear but at least we're seeing the exact selector that's being used 
uh, which is always super nice uh, right there. Even And then we sort of have to hunt for this. I'm guessing this will improve over time because um, that's a little bit a little bit misleading because that's not exactly the selector um, that we were looking at. But at least it does give us a little bit of an idea. And of course, we, we would see the original down here anyway. We have the button primary here, and then we have the and focus and add hover for it. So pretty easy to find what's happening in there. Another fun use case for this type of thing really fast would be on like navigations. Um, let's just say you wanted like a divider this way or more common. I'm not going to make a mobile nav right now, but if they stacked on top of each other and you wanted the line separators between them, uh, right, so on the li, so we could say here and say and li, and then in that one do an and not last child, and say that the border, uh, let's do a border right in this case of three pixels solid yellow, just so we can see it. Um, so they're all getting it except for the login here. So if I just, just for fun, if I take that off, hit save, and we can see that yellow, uh, maybe I'll make it orange so it stands out a bit more but that is showing up next to my login button. So uh, it's a little bit weird here because I've double nested it, but the and not could be very useful the same way um, doing the and hover and, and, you know, and the and focus. These types of little things like this are that part where like this little, it just makes our lives easier as devs um, and can be a bit faster to write. Another thing that's kind of interesting um, that it's not a super common pattern. This is possible in preprocessors as well um, is let's go find my hero. Let's just do a paragraph and let's say the color of our paragraphs is going to be um, we're going to go steel blue just so we can see that things change. So you can see all of them have changed. And what you could actually do is if we wanted, if you had different theming and stuff going on, there's other use cases for this, but I could say something like dark theme and then do my ampersand out here. Uh, and it looks a little bit funky because the ampersand is here, but then I could say that the color in this case is going to be a light blue. Uh, and then let's go over to my HTML. So then on my hero here, let's just add a dark theme, hit save. And you can see that the color actually switched on that. And of course we'd probably want to have something like then coming here and doing an and uh, dark theme is a background. I won't do a new gradient. Let's just do a background of black so it switches. Um, so if it's the dark theme, we get the light blue. And in this case, the steel blue and the regular time. So the steel blue down here, or maybe, you know, for fun, let's just make this yellow. So they're really different. Um, the thing I like about this pattern is that if I go to my paragraph, I can find all the styling for my paragraph in one place. Uh, which and I don't know if this is the change I would make. I'd probably rely more on inheritance than doing it this way, but uh, it's just it's nice to have one selector, and then you can find the different stuff going on with that selector instead of having to go and find your dark theme and then find all the different changes it's making. If you're going to do this, make sure you document it in some way or another because it's not sort of a normal thing that we actually see. But we're getting our paragraphs that are inside of our dark theme. So it looks kind of weird. Um, it could be definitely useful, but it's one of those things that if someone's not used to this, they'll have no idea what they've just come across. So document this if you're going to use it. Now I'm going to get rid of that because it's kind of ugly. <laughs> um, not that this site is beautiful by any means. The next thing I want to look at is my favorite thing, because I promised you we would talk about my favorite thing with nesting, which is that, remember, there's different symbols that are allowed. So our class selector can be working there. But another thing that works is the at symbol. And that means that we can now nest media queries. Uh, and this is the greatest thing ever. <laughs> and so let's say my hero, let's just boost the font size on here a bit. Font size is 1.25 rem, let's say. Uh, or oh, look, we made it smaller. Uh, but we'll stick with that because then what we can do is say an at media and do a min width of, we'll say 780 pixels. And we'll do a font size of 2 rem. And now it's really big. So let's we can open up our dev tools, click on the little responsive guy, and... As this shrinks down at one point, there we go, we get the smaller and the bigger font size coming in. And that's th this is one of this is something from the preprocessors that works the same way that I love so much. And I'm so happy it's coming to native CSS. Because um, as much as I still do use SAS, being able to um, do this <laughs> for me is so nice. Um, and we can just see it here at media and font size, and it's changing. And if I go in the end, it's the hero, <laughs> right? Uh, so we know exactly what's happening. We can find out where sort of what's going on with it. And the font size is getting switched um, right there. And the media query is working, even though I didn't have to, you know, I don't have to do hero again and then nest the media query inside that other selector and then add the stuff. Uh, I love this so very much. There is one really important thing with this, though, um, is let's actually take this out and do it the old way, the old painful way of doing it of right hero. Then you'd have your media query like that. Um, and 
the reason that this is a little bit of a gotcha, um, that potentially, is if I put this up here, because this is only for big screens, but then this is for all sizes, this is going to win because uh, it's coming afterwards. And nesting can actually change the order of your CSS, which is the first time I think um, that that actually comes up. Uh, there's with layers, you can sort of control stuff in a, a different way. Um, but this is the first time I think that it literally changes the order of your text or, or of your rules. So here, if I take this at media and I put it at the top, it's still going to work. And you can see the, the VS Code is not happy with me, but it's still working clearly. And the reason this is actually working is because regular declarations are going to be hoisted to the top. Um, it's when the browser parses through this, it's going to find all the regular ones, put them first, and then take anything that's nested inside and make new rules after that, because it still has to sort of go, okay, how is this impacting things lower down? Um, so the order here, again, if you have regular rules and then nested stuff, even if the regular, even if the nested things are coming first in the way the CSS is reading it, it comes after probably not a big deal. In this case, it actually could save you from a mistake you made because the media query should come afterwards anyway. But it is one of those things that maybe could cause an issue along the way uh, that you're not expecting. So it is important to be aware of that, um, that it can change the order of stuff. And another thing that's really important to understand is it can actually muck around with your specificity in unexpected ways as well. And to illustrate how this works, um, let's just come here and if we come and take a look uh, or you know what, let's give this, we have a section down here and just to sort of, we're gonna do an ID of uh, introduction. Cause you know, maybe you have IDs through and different stuff and you wanna style that introduction differently as well. So what you end up doing is, uh, or actually let's just, we'll stay with our hero here. And let's say our hero and our introduction are both getting similar styles here. We have the gradient that's on both of them, the font sizes, all of that, and that's great. Uh, and then I want to grab this H1 and my H2 here, and I want to style them. So then I come here and I say, and uh, H1 and H2, and I say color is red. And the color has gone to red on both of them. And that's that's exactly what we would expect to happen on these two things. Um, but then you know later on, it's a few days later, you forgot about that code a little bit, and you, want, you don't like this red, and you're looking at your HTML, and you see, oh, I have a page title there. Okay, let me come and style this. So I do page title and I say color is now blue and it doesn't work. Oh yeah, okay, well, you know, here we have this, or maybe even you look in your dev tools, right? We can find this in our dev tools. So you go and you look and you go, oh, it's this and h1, I forgot that I nested it inside of that, that hero thing that was coming here, okay. So that's not a problem and you might have seen a preview of why this is a problem. And so you might be saying that this is a class selector plus my h1, so I just need to match that specificity so we can match it with the h1 page title and it doesn't work. Huh, that's weird. Um, but our dev tools actually gave us the answer there. When I hovered on top of this, you can see that it says is hero introduction. And so if you have multiple selections here, and then we have stuff nested inside of that, the, the is is going to be used to create this into a selector. And so that can muck around with your specificity on things because all of a sudden the specificity of this H1 has an ID in it. Because if you're not familiar with how is works is it uses the highest specificity of all the selectors in there. So in this case, it's not combining these two together. It's just saying it's the same level as an ID selector. And so it's basically unbeatable, um, right? So it's just, it doesn't work. And uh, so it just means be careful with how you combine your selectors. And again, a lot of time you don't wanna be probably putting in IDs like that. But even if you're just using classes here and then you have that, it is a descendant selector. So we do wanna be careful with it, but you can have these unintended consequences with it as well. And so, yeah, that's more or less how it works. But there's a few important things that I think are worth addressing as well with this is, first of all, the, the way that nesting can affect readability and searchability especially when it's used within a preprocessor, a lot of people would complain about it because your and h1 wouldn't actually be the selector that you'd be able to find in your dev tools. And so then you'd find something, or as I said, you might even have something that looks like this in the code, but it looks very different in the finished CSS. Uh, and so it would make things very hard to search for at times. Now there were with maps and other stuff, there's ways to find it anyway, but uh, it was a complaint that would come up. And the other thing is readability. Uh, that is kind of can be awkward and especially like right here. This might look a little bit strange um, I think that if you're nesting super super deep readability is definitely impacted 
But I think a large part of readability a, is going to be the syntax highlighting improving, um, just because right now, this all being gray, I definitely think it doesn't do it any justice. But once you get used to how nesting works, uh, just like anything else, like when arrow functions first came to JS, they were kind of weird looking, and then you eventually get used to it. The same way here, uh, this is something that you may not be familiar with, but once you start using it enough, it doesn't really hurt the readability as much. The, you do have to glance up. And of course, if you have this giant thing that's all nested and you have to scroll up to see what the parent selector is, that can be a little bit annoying. So a couple of things to watch out for there. Then of course, <laughs> the, the big thing is what's browser support like. So here, if we come and take a look, the table might have a lot more green on it here than you expected. And we're at 70, as, as of recording, we're almost at 73% support. For something that's very new, that's awesome. Uh, it is coming in the next update of Firefox, so that means all the major browsers are going to be supporting it. Um, you know, the big thing now, it is in Safari and Safari on iOS, so it's rolling out. Now, of course, that does mean that older devices, well, you know, it's still a lot of people on the older devices for iOS, so it doesn't mean we can start using it immediately in production, and it is one of those things that if it doesn't work, it could break your site. So we do want to be careful with it if you are going to be using it, that it is something that once it has enough support will probably start being a lot more widely used because it is one of the people's favorite features from preprocessors like SAS and people saying that that's primarily reason they use SAS, so maybe they won't have to use it anymore. So I see this being something that's going to be widely adopted as soon as browser support does get a bit better with it. So playing around with it on personal projects and familiarizing yourself with it is probably a good idea. And speaking of preprocessors, I mentioned a few of the differences between how nesting works within native CSS and the preprocessors, uh, but I sort of just glanced over them. If you're someone who does use SAS and you'd like a much deeper breakdown into the differences and also what you know, what's going to happen to SAS nesting, you're curious about that, I covered it in this video right here, maybe there, because if that video is not showing up, it means it's not out yet because it's coming out two days after this video does. So if it's not out yet and you do not want to miss that video, then do make sure that you're subscribed to the channel. And with that, I would like to thank my enablers of awesome Bailey, Andrew, James, Enrico, Michael, Simon, Tim, and Johnny, as well as all my other patrons for their monthly support. And of course, until next time, don't forget to make your corner on the internet just a little bit more awesome.